Good morning, everyone. We're going to look at uh, John chapter 3, from verse 1 through 21. We're going to look at John chapter 3, from verse 1 through 21. All right, John chapter 3, from verse 1, it says... Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. No one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asks. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe, then how then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who has come from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict, light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does, not, who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. And the title of today's message, in verse 16 it says, For God so loved the world. So today's passage is the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And that, of course, leads to uh, the famous verse, uh, the beginning of which I use as the title of today's message, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and Pharisees, of course, were the people that Jesus had the most conflict with, yet Nicodemus, this Pharisee, came to have a deep conversation, speak to Jesus deeply. And so today, uh, as we look at the message, I want us to be able to relate to Nicodemus. I also want these words uh, of Jesus responding to Nicodemus as they're having this conversation. Jesus is responding to Nicodemus. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a passage really with a lot of red letter words. Uh, if your Bible uh, has the words of Jesus directly in red letters, you can see a lot of Jesus' red letter words here. And so as we look at the words of Jesus' response directly to Nicodemus, I hope uh, it also can be the response that we need. So how does this conversation start? So uh, first of all, we have Nicodemus. It describes him as a Pharisee, a member of the Jewish ruling council. And what it says is that in verse 2, he came to Jesus at night. So he comes at night to Jesus. So why is he coming at night? He's coming at night because although he is fascinated with Jesus' life and his ministry, he's also a bit scared and unsure about what people will think. I mean, he's a Pharisee. He's a member of the ruling council. And so, you know, he's a bit scared and unsure about what people will think, so that's why he comes at night. Now, how would they judge him? You know, I mean, Jesus' ministry looks great, but, you know, it's, it's a bit of an outcast towards the Pharisees and the Jewish ruling council. 
So that's why he's scared of what others will think. He comes at night. And Nicodemus is this kind of uh, person, you know, as you see. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, he's testing the waters a little bit. Uh, it's like, you know, there's a pool. You know, my kids, when they get to the pool, they don't know if the pool is cold or not, right? So, you, you know, you stick your foot <laughs> into the pool, you see if it's cold or not uh, before you jump in, right? So you kind of go in slowly, and that's... A little bit like what Nicodemus is doing here. You know, not, you know, he's seeing some of the amazing things that Jesus is doing, but not really sure. So, you know, he comes at night, you know, a little bit secretly like that to Jesus. And I think about Nicodemus coming like this to, to Jesus. And, uh, you know, do you have uh, friends or maybe you work with people like this that are a bit wishy-washy? Do you know what I'm saying when I use this term, wishy-washy? Not sure, not certain of their decisions. You know, some people, uh, I do this, you know, I'm buying something, right? And so, uh, you know, you know, really, it's just like a $5, $10, you know, little something. But, you know, I spend like an hour, you know, deciding between this one or that one. I'm reading, you know, all the reviews and trying to figure it out. And I waste so much time, you know, trying to figure out, you know, this one or that one, not sure. You know which brand uh, to buy. You know, there's sometimes it like uh, sometimes you know people are like this. I think people are like this. You know, when it comes to life, uh, young people. Uh, some people they young people especially find it hard to make decisions. You know, they keep testing the waters. You know, a little bit. You know, this one, this here or there. You know, try this one or that one. Should I make this decision or that decision? You know, I married pretty early in my life. I married at age 21. And some people, <laughs> you know, my advice to young people really is don't be, you know, wishy-washy. You know, don't be wishy-washy. Uh, you know, we must make clear, uh, informed, and prayerful decisions in life, right? You know, clear, informed, prayerful decisions and make those decisions in life. The famous nurse Florence Nightingale, she said, How very little can be done under the spirit of fear. And she's trying to say, you know, for this person who really accomplished so much, this, uh, you know, nurse of all nurses who launched, you know, who, who really launched nursing, you know, don't live scared in life. You know, that's what happens, right? You go in life, you, you keep living scared, to make this decision or that decision, and then what happens is, is a few years go by and then nothing happens, you know? I mean, you just too scared, a few years, nothing happens, and, and really how much time do we, have, do we have in our life? God gave us limited time, you know? We really have to use that time to the maximum, so how much time do we have to live, you know, really being scared like this? And at church, you know, you meet uh, all kinds of different types of people. And many people are exactly like this. You know, wishy-washy, you know, exactly like this. You know, always, you know, testing their waters. They're putting their foot in that, that water of church, not sure if they're going to, you know, to fully, you know, fully be a part of it. You know, you come to church, you listen to the Bible and the Word of God, and it's so good. You know, you listen to that word and that's so good and, and you see the people involved also and you see the people who have Jesus inside of their life and you realize that those people who have Jesus in their life, that they are so different than the people I meet in the world. And, and you know, I saw this. I, this is exactly what I saw first coming to church. You see people with a, a, a big, different, qualitative difference in their life. You know, it's not like they're overflowing with some kind of richness of the world or, 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 or they're famous or they're a celebrity or something like this. But, you know, there is something different about these people that have Jesus. There's a, a big qualitative difference about them, man. And they're different than the people I meet in the world. And, you know, what, what's the difference between them? I mean, it's the clear and obvious answer. They have Jesus in their life, right? They have accepted Jesus into their life, but... You know, a little bit wishy-washy. You know, should I do that? 
You know, should I accept Jesus into to my life as well too? You know, should I really have Jesus in, into my life? And then other people, they've accepted, you know, your, your living life and they've accepted Jesus into their life, but uh, they've accepted Jesus into life and then, you know, uh, the, then it's also about the work of the kingdom of God, right? You know, so they're a little bit wishy-washy about that. Should I really dedicate my life? You know, should I really dedicate my life to the kingdom? You know, and you have Christians that are like this as well too. Christians, they're, you know, working in the world, they're, they're doing something in the world, but, you know, they can't shake this part. They can't shake that, you know, I should live for something bigger. And they're not, they're not sure if they should live for, for God and, and, and they're just kind of stuck in the world. They're not sure what they should do. Uh, what would my friends think? What would my family think? You know, what would they think about that? Should I really do this? And it's, it's like wishy-washy. You know, it's like testing the waters. It's like Nicodemus. He's this Pharisee. He's the member of the high ruling council. And there's other people that are with him on that high ruling council. And, you know, they're not sure. You know, should, he's not sure. You know, and that's why, you know, he's a little bit testing the waters. He's you know, secretly going to, to Jesus at night. And so, you know, what does, Nic- what does Jesus have to say to Nicodemus if you look at what he says? This is in verse 3 and 4. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Uh, uh, so, you know, basically Nicodemus doesn't answer. He thinks when Jesus says, uh, be born again, Nicodemus you know, doesn't really understand. He thinks you know, he somehow needs to like, physically enter his mother's womb again, so he doesn't understand. So Jesus has to explain again, you know, a little bit more clearly. He says in verse 5, 5 through 8, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of the water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it's coming from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So what is Jesus saying? Uh, To truly see the kingdom of God, we must be born again of the water and the Spirit. He's saying to see the kingdom of God, we must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. And this is true. We need these two things. Things very clearly. Born again of the water, born again of the Spirit. You know, why is baptism so important? It's a, a clear public sign accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And so, you know, it's a very clear moment in a person's life, you know, publicly saying to all, I'm accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then with that, you know, with, with really, you know, with that, with that clear public sign, you know, the past sin washing away and being born again. This is baptism, right? The past sin being washed away. All that past things, all those past things you did, all those things that were, were chasing you and that sin that, that seems to, to lock me down, all that past sin is is, 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 is just being washed away, like water washing us, it washes away, and I'm being born again. It's that clear public sign that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And what is being born again of the Spirit? What is, what is being born again of the Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit? You know, God poured down His Spirit for truth, guiding us. You know, he, he poured down His Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit, this is the Spirit of the truth, Spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth is guiding us towards the kingdom of God. And so, you know, we need to live for the truth. We need to live for the Holy Spirit. And it's a, a clear decision. It's not me living for the world anymore. You know, I'm just being you know, blown by the wind of the world going here and there, living in whatever way. So many Christians like this. They accept Jesus, but still being blown by the winds of the world going here and there. But instead, it's, it's clearly living for the truth and being guided towards the kingdom of God. 
Now we need to live for the truth of the Holy Spirit. It's a clear decision living for the kingdom. So, you know, the first part, the first part is a fundamental acceptance of Jesus into my life, washing away my past sins and all those falsehoods. The second is a fundamental shift in the direction of my life and my worldview to live for something bigger and greater for the kingdom of God. You know, it's true, we simply cannot understand any of it. We cannot understand the kingdom of God. We cannot understand that life, that life for Jesus and the kingdom of God, unless we are born again. That's what Jesus is saying. We must be born again. It's not something that happens when you're wishy-washy and scared inside of life. It's not going to happen. won't happen. It won't happen if you're scared like that. You know, we cannot understand the peace of Jesus unless you really accept Him. You know, it's not like you're going to really accept and, uh, you know, you, 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 it's not like you're going to get the peace of Jesus into your life and into your heart by doing it at a distance. Like, I see other people who have Jesus in their life and, and they're doing well and I'm just sort of standing at a distance like watching them well and then somehow that peace is going to come to me. It's not. It's not going to happen in that way. You know, we must accept Jesus into our life. It's a personal, a personal acceptance of a relationship with Him into my life. That's how it happens. And, you know, He, he wonders, you know, can I see the kingdom? You know, do you really want to see the kingdom? Well, it's not going to happen from the outside. <laughs> I mean, it's not like, you know, you're going to watch the people who are working for the kingdom. You know, there's some people like think like this, you know. I'm going to work on the outside, and then I'm going to make a lot of money, and then I'm going to donate to the people who are working for the kingdom. And so, you know, I'm on the outside, and then somehow I, I give a little for the kingdom like this, and then I'm going to experience the kingdom like that? No, it's not going to happen. You know, 90% of my life is living outside of the kingdom, working, working in the world, and then, you know, I come to, to service, and then I'm... I'm, I'm donating like that, and then, and then I'm going to experience the kingdom like that. It's not going to happen. Won't happen. Won't happen at all. <laughs> you know? I mean, you think about it, and of course, you know, of course it's not going to happen like that. You, know, you can't be a part of the kingdom unless you're really living and working in the direction of the kingdom with your life. And, and Jesus is saying something very deep here. You know, really. You know, something, something deep here, you know, that, you know, you can, you know, you can physically, you know, you can physically be here. Nicodemus, you know, Nicodemus is physically in front of, of Jesus, but, you know, really, he, he, he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand. He, Jesus is trying to speak to them, you know, he doesn't understand anything. You know, you can try to test the waters. You can try to be wishy-washy with, you know, your feet. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's like you know, my, my, my two feet, one, one on one side and one on the other. I'm a little bit scared, not, not sure if I want to go in. But uh, you will never understand. You will never understand if, if, you're, if you're like this. You know, faith is about making a clear acceptance of Jesus into your life. It's about making a clear commitment towards living for the kingdom. And Jesus has that kind of message here for, for Nicodemus. Now he's saying, be born again. Be born again of the water and of the spirit. And really, I wish we can see that message of Jesus for us today in our life. And so, Nicodemus, so Jesus, he's, he's saying this to Nicodemus, but you know, he still doesn't understand. If you look at this, this is verse 9. How can this be? Nicodemus asks. And from verse 10 through 18, this is Jesus' response. From verse 10 through 18, You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, 
that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So, you know, Nicodemus, even after this explanation, he's still confused, and, and Jesus is, is a bit exasperated, you know, at his, at, at his fundamentals. You know, what's the problem? You know, Jesus is sort of explaining the problem. You know, we speak of, spoken to you of earthly things you do not believe, and if I speak to you about heavenly things, you know, it's, it's like two different levels, you know, is what Jesus is trying to say. It's like two different levels. You know, Jesus and Nicodemus, it's like heaven and earth, you know, completely, you know, completely two different levels, heaven and earth. And so, you know, Jesus quotes a, a very familiar and famous story to Nicodemus that Nicodemus was, would know. It's about Moses and the snake. So let's look at that. This is uh, Numbers, chapter 21. Uh, from verse 4 through 9. So this is the famous story that Nicodemus would know about Moses and the snake. Let's look at Numbers chapter 21, verse 4 through 9. Uh, they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. And so Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. And so Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. So, you know, this is a, a little bit of a story of, you know, the kind of complaints that uh, the people had, the Israelites had, uh, against God, against Moses in the desert. And so, you know, the people there... They're suffering by their own failings, and their only hope is to trust in something beyond. You know, the snakes are, are biting them. And so the idea here is, you know, God says, uh, you know, if you look at the, you create a bronze snake. So he creates a bronze snake. If you look at that, then you'll be healed, right? And so the idea is by simply looking at the bronze snake and being healed, it left no doubt that, of course, how were they being healed? They were being healed by God's power, not their own. You know, these people rummaging around in the desert, you know, they were, were and being bitten like that, they were being healed not by their own power, but by God's. And so it's a message. It's a message about salvation. You know, where does salvation come from? You know, salvation comes entirely by faith. And here we see, that's the fundamental difference that Nicodemus, between Nicodemus and Jesus. Jesus and Nicodemus are on two different levels. One is on, in heaven and one is on earth. Like that, it's like two different, completely different levels. And that's the fundamental difference between Nicodemus and Jesus is about their faith, the fundamental difference of their faith. A Pharisee is completely focused on the law and traditions and all the customs. They've got to follow them properly. They've got to follow all these things properly. And that is his worldview. That if I do the, the, the things, you know, the rules, right? You know, if I do the, 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 the rules I need to follow precisely well, you know, then, then I'm going to be well. You know, these things. That's his worldview. And so for Nicodemus, his salvation is self-focused. You know, I've got to follow these things, these things well. I follow all the traditions. I give all the sacrifice what he does. And, and, and for Nicodemus, that's how his salvation comes. By following those, those standards, those, those standards that I need to do, then, then I'm going to, to be well, live well like that. But what is Jesus talking about here? Jesus is saying we need to be completely focused on God. 
that our salvation can only be by the one and only Son of God. You know, this is saying that we can't do it by ourselves. That we need to look up. We need to look beyond ourselves. But, you know, we must put our trust and our faith in God by His amazing grace and love. So, you know, do you know how you can tell if a person has these kind of fundamentals, these kind of gospel fundamentals set up in faith. Uh, a lot of times, you know, as I see, you know, and as I live and work in ministry, you know, oftentimes it's about the questions that they ask. You know, when you're, when you're talking with them, when you're counseling with the person, it's about the questions they're asking. You can really tell about the fundamentals by, by the questions they're asking you. So, you know, a Nicodemus-like person, is very self-focused in faith. You know, he's always asking things like, how can I do better in this? How can I do better in that? How can I pray better? How can I listen the word better? How can I wake up earlier? How can I eat better and be more healthy? You know, how, you know, how can I know, you know, you know, how can I do all these things better? So, you know, you might ask, you know, well, what's wrong with that? You know, what's wrong with, with wanting to be better? You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And of course, to a large extent, as you're beginning in faith, you know, and as you're counseling with someone, you, you need to counsel about these things. How can you pray better? How can you wake up earlier, listen to the word better, eat better, be more healthy, all these kinds of things. But, you know, what happens is, is after some time, you start to see a trend. That all they're asking about is about these things. You know, of course, we need to do these things well, but the gospel is not self-help. You know, the gospel is not a self-help book. You know, the gospel is about a complete worldview shift. But a Nicodemus worldview is me, me, me. You know, me, me, me. You know, it's all about me, 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 me. But the gospel, the gospel is shifting the identity, you know, from me, me, me to Jesus Christ. That I only live in Jesus Christ. That I'm completely here by our Creator God and the grace of Jesus Christ who saved me. And God gives me my identity. And so, you know, when these fundamentals are are set up, you, you come to see this in a person. That their questions no longer, you know, you know, are just about me, me, me. But it's about something greater. You know, I like the way that Jesus summarizes all of this, all of this in the famous verses. Well, why is this verse, you know, so famous? It's because, you know, it's a, it's a very clear summary of the gospel. In verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, for God so loved the world. God loved the world. That He gave His one and only Son. You know, it's true. God loves the world. God loves the whole world and He loves us. But, you know, we're so self-centered. God loves the world and He loves us, but we're self-centered. You know, God, He does love me. You know, that's true. But He also loves the world as well too. God saves us and God saves the world. And there is a greater purpose beyond, beyond my life and my own things. That there is Jesus and there is, uh, it's for Jesus and for the kingdom of God. And so, you know, when, I, when my identity is no longer just about me, 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 and my things, you know, it's, it's that my happiness is no longer derived from just me doing well. You know, I do well. I have a car, I have a house, I have riches, I have fame, and I have those things. You know, my, you know, my happiness is no longer derived from, from me doing well, but since I have Jesus Christ in my life, my happiness is derived from seeing the kingdom of God. You know, it's true, you know, I mean, God, God He knows what I need. He knows what we need, so, you know, we shouldn't worry about those things. We always worry. You know, why do we worry when it's about me, me, me? You know, this is what happens when it's about me, me, me. When when it's always about me, 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 
the the conclusion is is we will never will never end up living up to our expectations. You know, you don't you don't live up to your own expectations like that ever. You know, there's no one that does. Uh, no one, no one out there ever lives up to uh, lives up to that. And so we don't live up to our, our expectations like that. And then, you know, you know, what does Jesus talk about? He's talking about condemnation here. In verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Oh, it's true. When you don't have a relationship with Jesus... You know, when my identity is just derived just, just, just in me, me, me. You know, it's a cycle of not meeting expectations, sinning, feeling guilty, self-torturing about myself. And the condemnation, and the condemnation, you know, the, the condemnation in me. But as it says here, Jesus did not come to condemn but to save. And that is the only way out of this condemnation. Everything else is just a cycle of me, me, me. Myself in this own little world I create. I live for myself. I live in this world I create for myself. But God loved, so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son to live for something greater. You know, we need to grow up, mature in life. You know, there's a, a big qualitative difference when you talk to someone, when you counsel with someone that has these kind of fundamentals set up in their life. You know, someone who's really living for the kingdom. The questions, you know, in counseling is no longer about me, 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 but, you know, I, I, I really, I see two things, you know, inside of, inside of you know, inside of talking to, to people with these fundamentals, this maturity set up. Number one, deep study in the Word of God, really wanting to know the Word of God more deeply. And number two, now, how can I make the kingdom of God one day come one day sooner? Now, how can I be a part of that? How can I make the God, kingdom of God come for one day sooner, living for something bigger and greater like that? Now, how can we suffer and serve together for the kingdom of God? You know, it's true, there's a, a very big, basic difference from the two. You know, we need to, we need to grow up, frankly. I think this is... The message I'm really trying to say to the, today, you know, this, this selfish, you know, baby mode, <laughs> oh, me, 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 you know, it's like this selfish baby mode of, of living, you know, we need to grow up, for the greatest in the kingdom of God is the one who suffers and serves and works for the kingdom of God to come, so, you know, truly, I wish that you know, in our faith, we can mature and, 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 and grow beyond our own selfishness and live for something greater, live for God's kingdom in that way. Finally, uh, let's look in verse uh, 19 through 21. From verse 19, uh, John chapter 3, from verse 19 through 21. This is the verdict, light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will, not, and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. So it's sort of a little bit of a, after this whole talk with Nicodemus, it's sort of like a, a summary verse to Nicodemus who's coming, you know, <laughs> Secretly at night to, to Jesus, Jesus is talking about coming out into the light clearly and openly and not hiding in the darkness. No, it's true. Those who have Jesus have nothing to be ashamed of. Nothing to be ashamed of. You know, the Lord's forgiveness allows us to come in the light. You know, was sin chasing after you? Well, once coming into the light of Jesus, it can harm you no longer. It can't harm you anymore. You know, we feel shameful, we feel condemned when we don't have Jesus. You know, hiding or sin, being fake on the outside. You know, and that's what happens. That's what happens when you live in the world with sin and being ashamed like that. But those who do God's work, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of. 
You know, when you're doing God's, when you have Jesus in your life and you're doing God's work, there's nothing to be ashamed of or light shines brightly with God. And so, you know, Nicodemus, here, he, he's really should be the example, uh, a Pharisee, a member of the ruling council. You know, he should be shining brightly out, but he's coming at night into the darkness, ashamed like this. But there is a good aspect about him. There's a good aspect that he's curious. You know, he is curious about Jesus' life and work. At least he's honest with himself. He's curious about Jesus' life, work, and ministry. And so, that, so, so the good part about Nicodemus is that he's curious about it. But what's more important is, is being like Jesus. The good part about Jesus is that Jesus, when you look at his life, he's a, a complete open book. He's not hiding anywhere. He's completely out, out there. His life is exposed and he is out there. You know, Jesus has no place to lay his head. That means he's living. He's just living, wandering, preaching from city to city, place to place. You know, he's completely out there. All the words he's saying, all the actions he's taking, he's doing them openly so that anyone can see it. You know, in Jesus, that's what we see. We see someone whose words, whose actions matches the truth. You know, he's full of abundant love and truth. You know, this is something that was not previously seen. And that's what makes Jesus special, that his life, his testimony itself, you know, his word was, was out there in the light, completely open like that. And like Jesus, you know, we need this as well too. You know, this is growing up. This is maturing in faith. It's living out into the light like that. You know, this is the advice I give, especially to young people, especially young brothers. Now, young brothers, they have a tendency to live in the dark, play video games, you know, <laughs> you know in the dark like this. You know, some friends I know, uh, they live with their parents for a very long time, you know, and just hiding, hiding like that, hiding underneath the shadow of their parents, you know, and then waiting, waiting for some big opportunity in their life like this. Like, they just keep waiting. You know, I have friends like that, they just, 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 just not ready to, to step out there, just always testing the waters, you know, scared into the dark, you know, waiting, you know, waiting for some big opportunity to happen in my life. Oh, something's, you know, going to happen and some big opportunity in my life. And, uh, you know, I told this to someone. I said to them, I think by far the biggest, the biggest impact on my life, you know, the biggest you know, the biggest impact on my life, other than, of course, you know, faith and dedicating the work of Kino. I'm just talking about, you know, in, in a practical sense, uh, by far the biggest impact on my life was, was getting married and having children at an early age. I had, I had children at the early age of, of 22. And so, you know, the common thinking, right, is, you know, we should be financially successful, you know, set, set up all these things well, be financially successful, you know, before having kids, right? You know, have all these things set up before having kids. But, you know, I think that's wrong, you know? You just, <laughs> you know what happens when you do that? Things just, you know, drag on. You know, you, know, you just keep, keep <laughs> waiting and waiting and waiting and hiding and things just drag on. But you get married and you have kids early. Now, this is my reflection on that. When you get married and you have kids early... You know, you mature quickly. You mature very quickly. You know, and I think this, is, this had the huge impact on my life, you know, growing up, really. Because, you know, what happens when you get married and you have, you know, kids quickly? Is that now your life is in front of other people. <laughs> you know, you have, you have your wife, and then you have your children. Your life is just, like, right in front of them. And so no longer are you living, like, in, in the dark, like, lonely, like, playing my video games. You know, living, living life in the dark, you know, like this. But, you know, you're, you're like exposed, you know, right there in front of like other people. And you have to deal with sin quickly. You know, oh, I sin. Oh, that's too bad. I sin. But, you know, you have to deal with that quickly in front of other people. And then you also have responsibility. You have responsibility to, to loved ones. And there's something, there's something to be said about living in the light, you know, like this. 
you know, this is something we should know also about the Christian life. The Christian life is a testimony of Jesus. And our life is, is, is a medium. It's a medium and to see, you know, to see. It's a, that, that, that's evangelism in and of itself. It's, it's our life, my life, how I live. And that, that light is a testimony. You know, so, you know, you don't really think about it, you know. It's like, it's like this. It's, it's like going to the gym, right? It's like going to the gym and like losing weight and becoming stronger, right? But, you know, you go to the gym and you ask like a professional, you know, the professional, the trainer at the gym, right? But what if this guy was like a, a fat guy? <laughs> you know, a fat guy and then he's like eating pizza or something like this. And then you're asking like this guy to be your trainer. You know, no one, <laughs> you know, no, no one would go to this person to be their trainer at the gym, right? You know, of course we would want someone fit and strong and, and drinking like protein shakes or whatever they're doing, right? And so the same is true when it comes to church evangelism and working for the kingdom of God. You know, our life is the medium. And so we should live well. We should live well by the truth and by love at the highest level. You know, be testimony in the light like this. You know, I think like this, if our church models the kingdom of God well in everything, you know, service, prayer, worship, fellowship, and love, then who wouldn't want to come? You know, the early church, it modeled a community living life well in truth and love for Jesus Christ. And, and this is where so many churches have fallen astray like that, living individualistically, living selfishly. You know, it's like, it's like for so many churches, it's like church is just on the side. You know, I live my individual life. I live, you know, in the darkness, off to the side by myself. And so many people, it's like coming to church at night. I mean, I'm not saying like physically come to church at light, but that's what they're doing. You know, they, 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 they live individualistically, but it's like they come to church, but it, it, it's like they're, they're just hiding most of their things, like 99% of the things, and just showing, you know, the, the 1%, and that, that's, that's just the foot inside of church, and, and that, that's all that comes. And, and so many churches have fallen astray because they're in darkness like that. And so, you know, our church, we must be the model of the kingdom, you know, living in the light like this. And I think it goes further in everything as well, too. You know, not just service and prayer and worship, but, but all things. You know, how we live, how we eat, our finances, our education, our family. All these things, all of it. All of it is a, is a testimony. We must live well and be a great testimony for the world. You know, people should think, looking at us, I want to live well like that. Right? I mean, isn't that the best testimony of the world in, in, in all things? You know, the best testimony of Jesus is someone looking at that person's life and saying, I want to live well like that. And so our life or church must be a testimony in that way. You know, St. Gregory of Naznizen said, Let us not ask of the Lord deceitful riches, nor the good things of this world, nor transitory honors, but let us ask for light. <laughs> let us ask for light. He simply asked for that. You know, so many people, they're asking for you know, riches and things of the world, but just asking for light. You know, I hope we also don't live selfishly for ourselves, but you know, we can live well, live for something greater, live for the kingdom. You know, be born again. Be born again as Jesus tells us to, as God calls us to. For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, who saved us. Let's accept Him into our life, live for something greater, be a testimony of your life and working for the kingdom. In that way, I hope you can mature quickly into the light. Only, only in Jesus can we cast away the darkness and sin, and only in Jesus can we live in the light of God's glory and for His kingdom. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord. Uh, we thank you that uh, you call us uh, into the light, Lord, for uh, we were the ones living in the darkness, living scared, uh, living unsure, wishy-washy, Lord. We come to see this, Lord. And in that way, uh, when we live scared and in that way, Lord, we come to see that we could not understand. But Lord, you called us to be born again. 
Be born again of the water and of the Spirit. Be born again in you, having a relationship with you. Clearly, out into the light, Lord, we wish to have a relationship with you, Lord. And Lord, you also called us to live by the Spirit, for the Holy Spirit, for the kingdom, Lord. You call us to live by that truth. And Lord, uh, we wish to be the ones that can do that, Lord. And Lord, uh, please, just allow us to uh, really uh, mature in our faith, Lord. Uh, Mature in not living selfishly for ourselves, but uh, really having the word deeply in our lives and wishing for the kingdom of God to come one day sooner, Lord. We wish to uh, quickly grow up and mature in faith like that, Lord. And for, uh, so, so Lord, allow us to come out into the light like that. Let our life be a testimony to so many others. Lord, uh, through you, allow us to really live uh, with your glory and your kingdom in our life. We thank you. And in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.